Sakuga. If you've spent any time among hardcore anime fans, you've likely heard the term at least once and may be wondering what it means. Is it a Pokemon, one of Boruto's dad's jutsus, a particularly impressive brand of cherry blossom? Technically, yes, it can be all of those things, because as you'll have likely picked up contextually if you've heard me use it in videos, Sakuga is a category of animation that is a defining feature of anime. Specifically, it's the part of the anime what looks real pretty. And that's about as specific as I can get, because like anime itself, Sakuga is a term we borrowed from Japanese, literally translating to working drawing, that is tricky to precisely define. You knows it when you sees it, but it's not a rigorous technical standard for animation with a certain frame count or level of line or layout complexity. Sakuga can look and feel like just about anything. It is, by its nature, the most creatively free and ambitious aspect of any anime in which it appears. So perhaps the easiest way to understand what Sakuga is, is to understand what it's not. Anime is fundamentally low-budget media, even by television standards. American high-concept prestige TV like Game of Thrones or Stranger Things can cost six to ten million dollars an episode. At the lower end, stuff like The Walking Dead and Supernatural tends to run in the two to three million dollar range. Japanese production companies aren't quite so forward with their finances, but it's reasonable to assume that tokusatsu series like Kamen Rider and Super Sentai hit seven digits per episode as well. TV anime, by comparison, brings fantastical concepts to life for two to three million dollars per season, meaning each episode of an anime will run its creators a couple hundred grand at most. And those rates are pretty well consistent throughout the industry. Even shows you might think of as high budget, like One Punch Man, fall comfortably in that range. It's other factors, like artist talent and passion, that make the difference between premium-feeling shows like that and other anime. It makes sense if you think about it. Recognizable voices demand lower salaries than famous faces. CGI effects can be a lot lower on detail when they're appearing next to 2D artwork. And animated set pieces and stunts only cost as much as the drawings that comprise them. Those should cost more. Animators in Japan are grossly underpaid, often making far less than minimum wage for far more than a 40-hour work week. But even if they all made three times as much per episode for the exact same work they do now, those episodes would still be relatively economical. That's because anime is produced astonishingly quickly, so no production has to pay most of its staff for very long. It's not uncommon for whole anime episodes to be turned around in a two-month period or less, pushed along an assembly line from writers to animators to the sound team, so that everyone's always working on something. And with long-running weekly anime based on big properties like One Piece and Pokemon, the turnaround time can be a handful of weeks or less. What makes this possible is tightly regimented scheduling built on an understanding that there's only so much animation that can be done in the time allotted. Many anime even have their per-episode frame counts fixed, along with their budgets, before any pre-production work is done, which of course has to be accounted for in the schedule as well. That means if you want to add some extra zhuzh to a big fight scene or amp up the emotion of your characters in a key dramatic moment, you might have to reduce some less vital dialogue here or a side character fight there to a series of easy-to-draw close-ups and near-static images with lots of dynamic camera panning to disguise the lack of motion beyond flapping lips. You know, something a handful of artists can knock out in a few hours while still looking half-decent. A lot of the cinematic flourishes and stylistic signifiers that we associate with anime are a direct product of this approach to efficiency. Conversely, much of what we associate with cartoons is a product of the different limited animation process devised by American animation studios like Hanna-Barbera during the syndicated cartoon boom of the 50s and 60s, but that's a topic for another video. If you want to maintain a consistent level of animated dynamism throughout a whole show, you're gonna want to design your characters to be quick to draw and redraw. That's why early Gainax and current Trigger shows are so stylized and cartoony, why Mob Psycho and FMA translate so well to animation, and why Pokemon's anime undertook such a dramatic visual shift for Sun and Moon. And those shows are, in my opinion, more fun to watch, or at least look at, than your average anime. But even they need to compromise on a lot of cuts to ensure that their biggest moments have the necessary oomph. 
Those stylistically compromised cuts are what we call limited animation, while sakuga refers to the sequences between them, where animators are given time to indulge themselves and us by letting their imaginations run wild. When the energy of One For All courses through Deku's veins and the camera spins wildly around him, that's a sakuga. When Mob throws half a city at Toichiro in midair, that's a sakuga. And when a waifu or husbando starts crying and you can see the individual tears beat up in their ducts, roll down their cheeks, and drip from their chin, that's a sakuga too. Drop them in at just the right moment and these sequences can elevate an already sad story to new heights of heartbreaking, breathtaking beauty, or dramatically enhance the weight and power of a character's abilities when they're finally fully unleashed for the first time. Character acting Sakuga externalizes the inner worlds of anime heroes and heroines in their most vulnerable, passionate moments. Action Sakuga makes the improbable and impossible stuff that we come to anime for in the first place feel real. And strong environmental or effects animation can make a wild, fantastical setting, and the magic contained within it, feel much more tangible. Another thing that can do that is science. Look, I don't have a good segue for this, but let me tell you about today's sponsor, Keeps. Hair loss sucks, and like many other things that suck, it's an almost unavoidable part of life. If the brush fire your parents started after conceiving you was blue, there's a two in three chance that you'll experience some form of male pattern baldness by the time you're 35. Now, if you've seen the gambling anime masterpiece Kaiji, then you'll know those ain't good odds. Although, despite the insanely high ugly bastard ratio in that show, it surprisingly doesn't reflect those odds. Like, even Hyoto's still clinging on to most of his mane and he's as ugly as bastards come. Sadly, real life isn't anime. Here, you can be enslaved under an inescapable mountain of debt and lose all your hair. But Keeps can help you with both problems. The key to keeping your blue shonen pro tag spikes well into your 80s is prevention. And modern science has produced several substances that, if applied to your roots on a regular basis, can halt ongoing hair loss in its tracks or even reverse the process a little if you're like Yume Jabami levels of lucky. I'm not going to promise you any miracles here, but Keeps isn't in the miracle business. They're in the proven science business. This stuff is FDA approved. It really can help you keep the hair you have, it works better the earlier you start it, and Keeps makes it affordable and discreet by connecting you with an online doctor to tailor a treatment plan to your needs and shipping generic versions of your prescriptions straight to your door every three months. No awkward waiting rooms, no long lines at the pharmacy, no brand name bills. And I've got a discount for you on top of that. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash basement or click the link in the description to get 50% off your first order today. Once more, that's keeps.com slash basement. But even when a show's setting is entirely mundane, Sakuga tends to feel pretty darn magical. Of course, you feel that the strongest in the moment it hits, but the thing is, that feeling can linger even when the animation puts its limiters back on. Executed properly, Sakuga leaves an impression in your mind of how the whole show should look and feel, of what its world and characters are really like when you zoom in and examine them at the highest possible level of fidelity. And that impression carries over to and colors how your brain interprets the less impressive parts of the show. Kinda like how the extremely detailed interior locations of Insomniac's Marvel's Spider-Man help to make its whole sandbox city feel more alive and lived in. As you experience an anime's sakuga, you begin to associate strong vocal inflections with the dramatic animations that sometimes accompany them, so that even when the characters are just flapping their lips, your mind projects those more expressive expressions onto them. When the camera pans fast and zooms in tight in a fight, obscuring the action, your brain fills in the blanks of what's happening off screen based on what you've previously seen these heroes and villains do. Just one shot of a camera moving through an environment can make every static background in the rest of a scene feel connected and three-dimensional. Or, to give a more specific and relevant example, you only really need to see the excruciating details of what the Osagi in ReZero is capable of once to make its every subsequent appearance equally horrifying. Paced out properly in conjunction with well-crafted limited cuts that effectively disguise their simple animation, a few doses of Sakuga can make a relatively inexpensive show feel like a truly premium product from start to finish. 
Ufotable has built its entire brand on this principle, making small screen shows that feel like they belong on the big screen by dropping explosively impressive bits of animation at satisfying moments and airbrushing over the gaps between them with simple but effective CG lighting and other post-processing effects that liven up the more limited scenes. It is, perhaps, a little easier to see what tricks they're pulling after you've seen another studio try and fail to achieve the same effect, and that's about the only reason I can think of that anyone should watch Handshakers ever. Now, that sort of stylistic flimflammery can only really be pulled off consistently in a seasonal show that has the pre-production lead time to plan it all out in advance. But long-running weekly anime had their own way of leveraging the power of Sakuga beyond what they're able to pull together in the limited time they have to make episodes. Canned Sakuga. Transformations, special attack sequences, and other inherently awesome repeatable story beats that justify their lavish production values through their ability to be inserted into multiple episodes, or even every episode of an anime, to pad out its runtime. You'd think they'd get old after a while, but the great ones never really do. When Ash Ketchum spins his cap and throws a Pokeball, when Sailor Moon's costume magically weaves itself into being around her, when Sakura spins her wand and hits a card, when this hand of Domon Kashu's glows with an awesome power, and its burning grip tells him to defeat you, and when Terriermon digivolves and his face contorts in agony as his pelt is ripped from his swelling wireframe and replaced with Gargamon's skin, holy shit, Tamers is dark. It instantly makes the adjacent fight feel more tangible and exciting, even if none of the other animation touches that level of quality. Honestly, I think young Jeff owed most of his anime addiction to those few really powerful moments of animation, and, uh, if you really think about it, anime openings are basically the ultimate example of canned Sakuga in action, so I don't know if all that much has changed in the interceding decades. Well, except for one big thing. I have a much deeper appreciation for the skill and artistry that goes into making these sequences and the shows around them now. There's one other vital aspect of Sakuga that makes it more than just good animation. The personal element. Obviously, all good animation is the product of an artist or group of artists' distinctive talents and passion. Even motion capture requires a great deal of finesse and skill at every stage of the process to look good. But Sakuga really puts the key animator at the forefront of the scene. The way they draw lines, how they handle smear frames, their unique sense of motion, timing, body language, expression, and framing, all of these distinct artistic sensibilities define the look and feel of a Sakuga cut. The goal of Sakuga, so much as it even has one, is not generally to make something that's wholly cohesive with the carefully massaged brand aesthetic of the production committee's animated commodity. There's rarely enough time to exert that much control over the artists while still letting them produce their best work. Rather, Sakuga allows them to blow the audience away with their vision and artistic ability as individual creators. Truly great Sakuga cuts act as animated autographs for the artists behind them, as inimitable and instantly recognizable to the discerning eye as their own signatures. Yutaka Nakamura, Yoshimichi Kameda, Hiroyuki Imaishi, Masami Goto, Shingo Natsume, Yo Yoshinori, Ichiro Itano. Sakuga fans know these artists, and many, many others, by their names and by their work. They can pick them out of a crowd shot by the swaying of the bodies and spot their signature flourishes in a fight scene from a mile away. There are whole communities dedicated to cataloging and correctly crediting these stunning animated sequences, be they crafted by well-known all-time greats or obscure up-and-coming amateurs. And while communities like Sakugaburu are fighting an uphill battle against the ever-swelling Artist Unknown tag, they fight it valiantly and score minor and major victories daily. It's not a precise science, many of the shots on the Boru's presumed tag are likely misattributed, but the fact that any shots not credited by official sources have been linked back to their creators, even dubiously, is a testament to just how much personality Sakuga artists infuse into their work. 
And there is something immensely satisfying about being able to track the artistic evolution of an animator across all of the different productions in which they've made their mark. The entertainment industry at large largely encourages us to associate the feelings that art evokes in us with the handful of brands that own the rights to that art instead of the armies of artists who actually went and made it. Sakuga breaks through that veil in a very powerful way. In this realm, at least, the animator is king, not just a disposable cog in the anime assembly line. The fruits of their labor and the talents they cultivate across different productions as they produce it are what the Sakuga fans are here for. And even if you're not actively aware of the Sakuga community, even if you don't know what a Sakuga is, I think you still feel that when you're watching a really juicy anime cut. The passion, the talent, the unique way of seeing the world that produced that specific imagery and motion, the human touch behind it all reaches through the static and connects with you as a viewer. Sakuga is one of the most potently and viscerally alluring things about anime when you're first introduced to it, and that power only grows the more you learn about it. Let me know in the comments down below who your favorite animators are, if you have any, or if not, what moments from anime most stand out to you looking back on it. I'm sure some Sakuga fans watching this can tell you who made them happen. And while I've got you here, consider checking out my recent rundown of the best anime openings of 2020 or my list of Avatar's best fights for more Sakuga sweetness. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.